All right, we're ready. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Ford Hall Forum at Suffolk University. I'm Jennifer Bernardi, the Executive Director of the Ford Hall Forum, where our programs provoke thought and encourage you to listen, learn, and engage. Thank you so much for attending tonight's discussion, The New Boston Miracle. Uh, allow me to take this time to thank the Ford Hall Forum's generous sponsors, including, among others, the Lowell Institute, the Massachusetts Cultural Council, the Barr Foundation, the Nellie May Education Foundation, and our partners at Suffolk University, which serves as the forum's home base. This is a Suffolk building, if you can believe it or not. Uh, we especially thank our season sponsor, the Boston Beer Company, makers of Samuel Adams Beer. Yeah, we got applause for that last time. <laughs> I saw some nods out there. Uh, and of course, our forum thanks our members whose generosity makes this free public event possible. If you are not a member of the Fort Hall Forum yet, uh, definitely become one today by visiting our information table before you leave. Uh, Fort Hall Forum's Vice President of the Board, John Tai, was scheduled to moderate tonight, uh, but he had an emergency. I'm so pleased that I found a fantastic pinch hitter for tonight, and even more pleased that she fell prey to my stalking and agreed to do it. <laughs> Allow me to introduce Dr. Erica Jibo. Uh, Dr. Erica Jibo is an associate professor of sociology and a co-director for the Center of Crime and Justice Policy Research at Suffolk University. Her areas of specialty and publications are in uh, juvenile justice and crime policy and evaluation. <coughs> she is currently working with the cities of Boston and Springfield and the tri-city area of Fitchburg, Leominster, and Gardner on gang reduction initiatives. Uh, Dr. Jibo is the co-editor with Brenda Bond of a forthcoming volume from Lexington Books entitled Beyond Suppression, Comprehensive <coughs> Community Strategies to Reduce Gang Violence, which discusses strategies used in Massachusetts to combat gang violence. Can you believe I got her on like 24 hours notice? Please give a warm welcome to Dr. <laughs> our distinguished panelists today with a brief introduction and then we'll get into a brief uh, question and answer period um, with them and then we'll open it up for audience participation. Um, so first I would like to do, introduce all the way to my left here, David M. Kennedy. He is the director of the Center for Crime Prevention and Control as well as professor of criminal justice at John Jay College. He spent much of the last 25 years in some of the country's most dangerous neighborhoods, working with those communities to find solutions to crime. He has received two Weber CV Awards from the International Association of Chiefs of Police, two Innovations in American Government Awards from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and a Herman Goldstein Problem Oriented Policing Award. His work has been used as a model or source for safety and drug intervention initiatives by the Clinton and Bush administrations and by the Bureau of Justice. Kennedy also engineered the Boston Miracle, a dramatic initiative that helped to prevent gang and drug violence in the 1990s in this city and cut youth homicide here by two thirds. Welcome, David. <laughs> and then I'm myself. <laughs> single handed. Um, and then I'd like to introduce Carmen Ortiz, um, the second from my left. Since 1997, Carmen Ortiz has served at the US, as the U.S. Attorney for Massachusetts, specializing in white-collar crimes. Before joining the U.S. Attorney's Office, she worked with Harvard colleague Philip Heyman to investigate sexual assault claims against the New England Patriots, as well as being appointed as a member of a team appointed by the U.S. Senate to investigate the October Surprise, which involved claims that the 1980 Reagan-Bush campaign had conducted improper dealings with Iranian representatives to delay the release of American hostages and undermine President Carter's re-election. Ortiz worked at the Center for Criminal Justice at Harvard Law School from 1998 through 1991, 2001. She also participated in the State Department's USAID program to install judicial reforms in the Guatemalan legal system. For several years, Ortiz worked in the Middlesex District Attorney's Office. She graduated from Adelphi University and received her JD from the National Law Center at George Washington University. Welcome. one of the nation's leading experts on African-American music and culture, as well as cutting-edge research on bridging the generational divide. Price is an associate professor of music and African-American studies at Northeastern University, as well as the chair of the Department of African-American Studies. A former research fellow of the 
E.B. Du Bois Institute for African and African American Research at Harvard University. Price is currently a research fellow at Northeastern Center for the Study of Sport and Society. Price is also an associate minister and minister of music and worship at the Greater Framingham Community Church. Price is the executive editor of the Encyclopedia of African American Music, <coughs> author of Hip Hop Culture, and editor of the Black Church Hip Hop Culture and the Dilemma of the Generational Divide. He served as a guest lecturer at over 20 universities nationwide and provided trainings for hundreds of educators and organizations. He has a BA in music from the University of California, Berkeley, an MA and a PhD in ethnomusicology from the University of Pittsburgh. Welcome, Emma. Okay, well, welcome, everyone. And this is going to be an exciting panel um, and an uplifting panel, I believe. So. Um, we'd like to start tonight by talking briefly, and just briefly to set the stage, about the Boston Miracle um, in the 1990s. And then from there, continue to what is going on today and what could be happening and what changes we could be seeing in the future. So I would like to open up the discussion um, tonight to the panelists to briefly explain what happened in the what we refer to as the Boston Miracle. <laughs> um, more than anything else, and, and um, this book I've just written is not an academic book, so I got to unleash myself a little bit. And there's a line that says, I always needed that phrase, it wasn't a miracle, it was a lot of work. <laughs> and it was. Um, in a lot of cities, people are working extraordinarily hard on, on these issues. And most of what they do doesn't work. And the amazing thing about what happened in Boston in the mid-1990s was that a group of, of folks finally figured out something that actually did work. And it felt miraculous, but it actually is pretty common sense. So here's, here's how this works. Here, here's what happened in Boston. The Boston Police Department, so the, the Youth Violence Strike Force, which is basically DPD's gang unit, uh, let a little team of, of me and my friends in from the McKinney School. And they taught us something that nobody knew about the way the streets worked. So they knew it, they knew they knew it, and we never asked them before. And what they showed us turns out to be true about every city with a serious violence problem, which is that an overwhelming proportion of the violence, and especially the violence and street, street killing and that kind of thing, comes back to a vanishingly small population of active groups on the street. In Boston, they call them gangs. Um, Boston doesn't have bloods and crips and that kind of thing. So these were pretty loose neighborhood drug crews. And the concentration is amazing. So we're, we're doing this work in Cincinnati right now. 61 groups, 1,500 people all together. That's less than a half of a percent of the city's population, and they drive 75% of all the killing in Cincinnati. It is fantastically concentrated. In Boston, the numbers were 61 groups, 1,300 people, at least two-thirds of all the youth homicide in the city. And this is the bad crack days when we were losing about a kid a week. And they were also this existing cadre of folks in Boston doing something that stopped, which they also chose. And it took us, what tells us story, it took us nine months to understand what they were doing. But when the light bulb finally went off, it turned out that what they were doing was when one of these groups got really off the hook, they would go to it directly and they would talk to it. And they would say, look, we know who you are, we know what you're doing, the violence is going to stop. And until it does, we are going to be all over you. So the beauty of gangs in this weird way is that they are profligate sinners. And for every homicide they commit, which is rare, they do lots of drug sales and drug use, and they carry weapons, and they violate the probation and parole, and they have outstanding warrants, and they have open cases. And the U.S. attorney will tell you what the average record of trying these guys looks like. It's a new honest. And what that meant was that when they focused this way, they could essentially tax the group by just enforcing the law against it in a very focused, sustained way. 
And when the group realized that this was not going to stop until they put their guns down, they put their guns down. And at the same time, these gang folks would bring in the city of Boston outreach workers, they would bring in street activists, black ministers from Tinpoint, they would bring in social services. So there was this whole package. And when we finally got that, that is what we built into Operation Ceasefire. So we identified the groups. Each group has people on probation and parole. That means you could have probation and parole order essentially representatives of the groups to the meeting. They would walk into a room like this one, only not nearly so pretty. And there would be law enforcement, community people, and social service providers. And everybody would look at them and say, violence has to stop. Your own community is being torn apart by this. Your community needs it to stop. Here's the number you call if you want social service help and to you know, help get off the street. And all the folks in law enforcement, state, federal, everybody, are going to follow the violence. And so when you leave the room, whatever group in the city of Boston puts the next body on the ground, that's where we're going. And there were two meetings in Boston, and it all stopped. And it was, that was the Boston miracle. Two meetings. And that has now been replicated all over the country. And I, I can't explain this any quicker than that, so I'm sorry for taking all this air time. But let me tell you one story, which is that this stuff is travel they're doing it in the worst neighborhood in Sacramento. They began this over a year ago in the worst neighborhood in Sacramento, intergenerational gang and drug area. And since that first meeting in that worst neighborhood in Sacramento, there has been one non-fatal shooting. So this, this is the message of the book. This is why it's time to write it. This stuff works. We know how to do it. It doesn't work the way everybody thinks it works. It's a little odd, but it's very effective. And actually, could you just plug your book a little bit? I don't think we know the title of it yet. We haven't mentioned that, so let's just. The book is called Don't Shoot. <laughs> <laughs> because that's the message. <laughs> so I think that if we were to parse out the key elements from the Boston Miracle or the ceasefire, however you choose to think about it, um, into what has been parlayed into other parts of the country. And is this just nationally or, or internationally? What would those key elements be? So it, there is almost a recipe. So it's not quite this simple. But you, you look for these active groups and individual violent offenders, and they stand out in, in any community. They're pretty easy to identify. You have to talk to them. Right? This turns out nobody's been able to figure out how to, to manage this without actually having a relationship with what we think of as the bad guys. We're not nearly as bad as we think, but that's an organization. So you gotta talk to them. You gotta talk to them repeatedly, just like you do to your own kids. You don't tell them once, you tell them over and over again. And there is this core framework to the intervention. So one is what we've come to call the moral voice of the community. It is the affected community saying, we don't want this, which everybody thinks is soft and silly, and it's really not. So um, let's do a little experiment. Uh, show of hands, please. Who here grew up being really afraid of the police? Really afraid of the police when you were growing up. If you were really afraid of the police, raise your hand. Right, a few people raised their hand. Uh, hands down. When you were growing up, who was really afraid of your mother? <laughs> That's how it works. <laughs> this, is, this is what practitioners call informal social control. And the fact is, mom trumps the feds almost every single time. Um, so when the community says really clearly, we love you, but we don't want what's going on, it turns out that Many of these guys are in this. Um, they need help, so not everybody will take it, but it has to be there. The community has to see that it's there if they do want it, that we care, care about people and we do what we can for them. And there has to be anywhere else, because just asking and just helping doesn't work. And it can't be the regular or else. Right? It can't be just the routine grinding of the criminal justice system, which in this fine country of ours now means that one in three black men will go to prison during their lifetime, um, and which destroys them and their families and their communities. It has to be a different way of using our legal power. And it turns
comes out just as a matter of fact, but you can say to a group full of gangs, we will sanction the first one in the city to kill somebody after this conversation. And every time you say that, if they believe you, nobody wants to be the first gang, and you don't actually have to drop the hammer like that. So there are other ways that we've come up with of, of being sort of very newly strategic about how, how to do law enforcement, but you have to do law enforcement. And Carmen, maybe you could add to that. What is going on here in Massachusetts that takes these sort of this recipe, if you will, and put that to use? Sure. Um, well, I think the way that you ended is a great way for me to start because the enforcement piece is a significant piece of it. Uh, and what David said is exactly right. It's a small number of individuals that are causing most of the so the key is how do you identify those individu individuals? What kind of information do you use? And what's going on right now is that, especially now in Boston, I think that 20 years ago, 15 years ago when this started, there was a, a real concerted effort and it worked because a lot of different agencies, a lot of different individuals from different interests worked well together. There was sort of a drop off in that. Um, in, in I would say maybe the last, um, you know, anywhere from five to eight years, and then more recently it's picked up again. And I'll focus in, in Boston, although in a moment I'll talk about other areas of the state that are having significant problems and that we've been working with the local authorities to try to address those problems with youth violence. But the enforcement piece of it, uh, the key is that what's happening now is you have a very dedicated police commissioner that, um, you know, this is, when David started this whole, uh, you know, the Boston miracle, the ceasefire operation, that was new, that was original. Right now, people get it. People get that you have to work together, that you have to include um, the court, the police, the DA, the schools, probation, street workers, community organization, faith-based organizations. We try to work together to deal with the problem. This is not just a law enforcement problem you know, or a community problem. This is really a complex and, and a unified problem that we all have to work together to address. And so, in that respect, um, now you have a, a police commissioner who really understands that prospect, and a mayor that really <coughs> supports that as well, because you need resources uh, to, to play into this as well. You need enough police officers, you need enough you know, um, other um, community organizations that have the resources to address some of these problems. So the law enforcement piece is that the message goes out that if you engage in this kind of violence, and you cause havoc in your neighborhood, and you've been identified as one of the key impact players, as we refer to them, uh, then you're going to get prosecuted for an offense. And it's not just going to be a revolving door prosecution like a lot of, uh, was referred to previously, like with local prosecutions, but federally, if you're a, an individual who's been previously convicted as, as a felon, and you're carrying a gun, um, then you can be prosecuted federally. You're a felon someone with a prior felony conviction in possession of a firearm. And if you have prior violent, uh, what we call them as predicate, uh, prior convictions, um, felony convictions, and if you have three of those on your record, and now you're a felon in possession, which many of these individuals, you know, defendants may have, and gang members or others um, engaged in violence, uh, then you can go away for a mandatory minimum of 15 years. Uh, and, and we make, and, and so there are law enforcement prosecutions, and when you get prosecuted federally, not only do you, can you get sentenced to the mandatory minimum for that type of an offense, but then you're going to do your, serve your time in a federal prison, which is not going to be at Suffolk County House of Correction. It could be somewhere in the middle of the country where you're not gonna be able to see your family, you're not gonna be able to see your friends. You'll get certain restrictions placed on you when you're on probation. Uh, in terms of staying out of the neighborhood, staying away from certain individuals that have been identified as causing the crime. And so that's the law enforcement piece of it. And so that's the or else. And that's what we try to avoid. And now what, what is happening is I think twofold. One is that we're trying to get the message that, um, that this can happen so that it has a deterrence factor, but that, th that you have choices. You don't have to be at this. Um, we're also working with individuals that are that could be impact players but aren't. So that they're not the armed career criminals, but they're significant players. 
And so we try to identify that through the Boston Regional Intelligence Center, through the police department. We get information that helps us to identify uh, what kind of, uh, uh, of a violent offender this individual is. And while perhaps five and eight years ago, when, when um, the Operation Ceasefire had where automatically if you were prosecuted in federal court, you would receive a 15 sentence. It would be um, more the armed career criminals. We're trying to identify more impact players where perhaps the sentence is four, through anywhere from three to five, six years, but with the idea that when you get out, we're going to work with you into, in terms of a reentry program. And we try to structure programs to help you come back so that you have the structure in place so that you can get a job, you can get certain services and certain assistance and structure. The court works you to give you structure so that you don't fall into those bad decisions. That, that's on the law enforcement and, and uh, the, the reentry aspect. We're also very focused, when I say we, I say the Department of Justice, the U.S. Attorney's Office, in working on prevention and intervention programs with the community. Um, you know, I, I speak a lot at different schools. I work with different community organizations. And, 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 and for example, in Boston in particular, I know that there are two recent um, programs, um, the National Forum on Youth Violence, the mayor set up the Family Information Center, because you've figured out that, especially with kids at risk, it's not just that, kid's not just a bad kid, there are a lot of things going on. And so the family may need assistance, there could be a, a brother or another sibling that, that has a prior record and that may be drawing that individual to violence. So the key is to try to come up with an all around remedy uh, and, and, and solution <coughs> to the problem because just prosecuting and locking up an individual isn't going to work. Thank you. Thank you. And so we've heard about, you know, specifically about what law enforcement does working together collaboratively and maybe Emmett could add a little bit more about this other piece around comprehensiveness and communities and his work. Well, I think the challenge of the Boston Miracle for me is that it was finally an opportunity to empower young people to take ownership of their destiny. And so as much as it was bringing together all these agencies and these great um, power thinkers and decision makers and uh, like I'd like to talk to the young people about these adults, right, uh, into an adult room um, to fix a young person problem. Um, it was finally an opportunity at some point to empower the young people to say enough is enough. When we look at the history of youth culture, um, and particularly if you look, look at the history of the, the evolution or innovation of hip hop culture, it literally was young people who said enough is enough. It was gang bangers who said, we're tired of burying our friends and seeing each other you know, dead on the street. So let's use our energy and use the access points that we have in order to develop this, what we now call a hip hop culture. Now of course around 84, 85 it turns bad and that's a whole other conversation. But the evolution and innovative uh, force of hip hop culture in its, in its early days, in the early 1970s, was youth inspired, not industry inspired. And it was young people who said enough is enough, it's time for us to take these streets back. Um, and so for me, the notion of success comes out of the relationship building, which we have a challenge at because we have a tendency to, to prevent relationship building by the abuses that we put upon our young people, right? So when they become they and them and those and you know those over there that we typecast as being bad, whether it happens in a third grade classroom because the student is not passing the MCAS or whether it happens in you know, whatever community because this student doesn't have access to health care, we've already put them in an incubator to end up in you know, this, this kind of group. So I mean this thing of gang violence and youth violence is, is systemic, uh, but it's also interrelated with health care and employment issues. It's, inter it's interrelated with the ineffectiveness, the <coughs> access of, of, of education with the inequality of the application of jurisprudence. I mean, this is a, a, a complex thing, and, and from my perspective, I'm not sure a one-size-fits-all equation or recipe works. Um, I remember in Los Angeles growing up where I, I grew up, and, and, and you're right, uh, the gang situation in Los Angeles was totally different because in my opinion, it, it was like the original um, of, of the pandemic. But the issue is we made it a black issue. Right? So we never dealt with the gangs, uh, the KK, the Korean killers, right? It, 
Did you guys know there was a Korean gang? You know, we never dealt with the Samoan gangs that were, I mean, shooting folks, and, and we never dealt with the, with the Mexican gangs, 18th Street, right? Which was a huge gang there. We made it a black issue, right? The same way we do now. So we don't talk about the Latina and the Latinos, right? We don't talk about the women at all either, mm -hmm. right? Who are really populating our prisons, right? And, and who are gangbangers as well. <laughs> and, and we kind of truncate this thing to one subset. Uh, and I think it's problematic because it doesn't allow everybody to have the full realm of the perspective that's going on. And if we don't acknowledge the full bandwidth of the problem, we can't solve it. You know, so, so I think you know, part of the issue is relationship building and also being open and honest about what we're really dealing with. You know, the gang problem is the, the last, it's like the scab of a wound. It's the last thing that happens. You know, first you have the trauma of the penetration, and then you have the, the infection, right? And then you have the body trying to heal itself, and for whatever reason, not enough white blood cells or whatever, it's just not able to do it by itself, and then you have you know, external forces trying to medicate it and bandage it and whatnot. And then eventually you have a scab. And the goal is to keep the scab on so the body can keep doing it. I mean, it's like that. And it has multiple phases and multiple you know, uh, 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 layers of it. And, and so for me, the relationship piece, can we get to the point where we can love our children and allow them to be our children and not them, those, or they? That's great. I, I like how you rephrase this as relationship building. And I'm wondering, David, does that fit with what you're talking about, the moral voice of the community? Yeah, it absolutely does. And one of, one of the many things I learned in that amazing first nine months that we were set up trying to make our way through this in Boston was another thing that not only the community people and the outreach workers and, and those folks knew and maybe you would expect them to, to know what I'm about to say, but the cops knew it too. And that was that what was most driving the craziness on the streets was how absolutely scared to death these mm -hmm. kids were. Um, the, the word at the time for them was super predators. Right, so this was this idea that came out of a bunch of conservative scholars and criminologists that, that this, this was the, the, the biggest, baddest generation any society had ever known. And, and I quote, because I remember that, that singularly remorseless, driven by animal appetites, <coughs> the, the, the sheer racism of it was, was hardly even veiled. And it, it caught the national attention. It was one of these incredibly bad ideas whose time had come. And it, it led to wholesale reform in juvenile justice all over the country. Some, some states got rid of their juvenile justice system. That this is when the automatic waivers to it, adult court came. All, all this it, terribly destructive stuff. And then you talk to these kids, and they were crazy. They were terrified. Mm. And what they would say to you is, nobody's protecting me. And it is unbelievably dangerous out there. And they were right. So as, as we started putting the numbers together for Boston, um, this was the peak of the crack era. The, the homicide epidemic was one of the biggest national problems. The homicide rate for the country at its peak hit about 10 per 100,000. So this is every year 10, 10 homicide victims per 100,000 in the population. If you were in the, the community of 1,300 gang members in Boston, your homicide rate was about 1,400 per 100,000 every year. And our math said that if you, were, if you were in the life for nine years, one in seven of you was going to get killed by gunshot. And the math is that all the non-fatalities, the way that works, is that basically everybody got shot. Not everybody got killed, but everybody got shot. And you talk to them, and that was what their life was like. I, I, I used to say in my, my interview, uh, have you ever been shot at? And they had this kind of Eskimo word for snow response to this question, which would, what do you mean exactly? 
does it have to be that he was shooting at me, or I was just there, or I was with my friends and he was getting shot at, or the bullet came through my house by accident? You know, tell me what you mean. And you just sat there in disbelief that this was their life. And what they would all say was, I'm protecting myself because nobody's protecting me. And when, when they were protected, and when they had a way of backing out without losing face and, and kissing their friends and all that kind of thing, almost all of them would take it. You know, this is this is why it worked so well, because they wanted out to be like And the other piece is that there were alternatives. There were the carrots for getting out, um, the programs, the GED, and those sorts of things. Um, so has the nature of violence or gangs changed that much since this 20 years ago in that we have to change strategies or do we you still use those recipes and that are going to be the same? Are the gangs different now? Are the, is the violence different today? I think everything's different. Mm -hmm. I mean, the only thing that remains constant is change. Mm -hmm. And the reality is this, that it's not just the gang bangers that are shooting people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Right? It's, it's good, wholesome suburban kids who walk into the schoolhouse with a shotgun and, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, in, in, in the Midwest or, you know, whatever. And, and the reality is we got to get away from the stereotyping and the typecasting and really get back to the realization is that young people should allow, be allowed to be young people. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, we've robbed young people of their innocence by our over gratification of the economic system and capitalistic greed and you know our desire to really market to 11, 12, 13 year olds and we want to force them to be adults in content in television and radio and movie stuff but then when it comes back to being a society we want them to be young people. So how do you give somebody an adult card and then when you think it's convenient for you pull it back and say no don't you forget you're a child. Well they weren't a child when you were you know putting all kind of you know uh, pornographic stuff on television at 6 p.m. I mean, and so the realization is we're conflicted in what our responsibility is. And when that comes up, we have a lot of guilt. And so we bring it back to the individualistic sense. I don't allow that in my house. Well, okay, that's cool, but you live in a neighborhood, right? So what happens to the friend of your child who goes to the school, and we know most of the learning takes place on the playground, right? Where, where boys learn to be boys and, and girls learn to be girls. That happens on the playground, that ain't home, right? So what happens to the adults of the community being the protectors and the keepers of the community? Well, I mean, unfortunately, a lot of us live in gated communities and we keep our houses gated down and we don't come out and play no more. We, you know, kind of text each other instead of coming outside on the front lawn and, you know, we don't borrow eggs and sugar from each other anymore and all that good wholesome stuff and leave the beaver and the walkers and all that good stuff. You know, but the reality is, is we've changed. And so we, our young people are dealing with our adult issues. Mm -hmm. Us trying to understand who we are. What is a family? What is marriage? Is it okay? Is it not okay? And then a young person watches their grandmother work for 35 years and three days before retirement get fired. And you want that young person to go to college and get a job? Mm -hmm. I mean, so, so the whole sense of society is changing, mm -hmm. and we don't want to have the conversations. Right? We act like everything's going to be okay. You just do what I tell you to do. Do it the way I tell you to do it, as if I've never made any mistakes. I was speaking with, uh, with, with, with a young lady out here, and I was saying, in many ways, the only difference between me and the they that we were talking about is I didn't get caught. Mm -hmm. Come on. Right? I didn't get caught. You know, I had a gun and, you know, I was doing all kinds of stuff. I never shot anybody, but, you know, I was doing all kinds of stuff. Because if you didn't, you were a bigger target. Mm -hmm. Right? You were the person who didn't fit in. Right? And so this social norm of all this stuff, we got to change all that. Right? It was some very important individuals in my life who stood up to me and said, I'm not afraid of you. Matter of fact, I love you enough to tell you that you have hope, you have possibility, you have a future. And because of those people, and I always give them credit, I was able to do what I do now. And be a professor and be a minister and help change people's lives. But it's not because of my own stuff. It was because people cared enough about me to intervene and intercede and say, uh, -uh you're going down the wrong path. 
So yeah, there's change. <laughs> and the change you're talking about, right, is adultification, more of the adultification of youth and how that affects communities and how we need to stand up. Um, from your perspective, maybe Carmen, if you want to talk about, have things changed from where you sit? Um, they have, they have, and I think that's why our strategy has to change a bit in that as well. I think that, um, you know, our kids are committing um, crimes younger and younger, and um, there is also a detachment um, that they sense, and that's why they're committing crimes. I think that when you are subjected uh, to violence and surrounded by violence, it's like you become immune to it, uh, and it's as if it's more an acceptable uh, to some extent. And, and I'm talking about all sorts of violence. I'm talking about domestic violence plays a role. Uh, substance abuse, drug <coughs> abuse in the home plays a role. No structure at home. Um, no structure or lack of attention in school. Because you're right, if you're identified as sort of an outlier, like they're not the smart one, they're not aggressive, their parents don't care, and the attention goes to others, then that's the kid that gets lost in the system. That's the kid that falls through the crack. That's the kid that's vulnerable uh, to associate and make the wrong choices. And so we need to, to spend time uh, on focusing. And I think it's not just parents, it's the community. The community, because you know we can identify uh, and, and, and see where there are vulnerable children. So we have to ad address them at a younger age. We have to, I think, really deal with um, <coughs> the exposure to violence and try to negate that or try to deal with it so that you know families have resources to, to so that their children aren't as exposed. And you're right, it's, it's an adult. It's not just violence, it's a lot of other, you know, social areas from 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 drugs and alcohol to, to sex. Our kids are becoming adults much younger. But I also think that, that as a result they're committing crimes um, um, uh, younger. And I think also they're utilized by older. They're older, you know, if the older that you are and the record that you have, if you get caught with a gun, you're the one that's gonna get arrested and go away for a long time. So if you can have a younger kid carry the gun for you, uh, you know, hold the drugs for you when you see the police coming around, uh, you know, uh, doing their street walk, and, and, and so the, the younger individual gets caught with the crime thinking that they're gonna do less, less of, you know, f face less punishment, um, that, that's what's happening, they're being utilized that way. And there's more sporadic. I don't think, I think in, in, before the gangs were more concentrated and perhaps more a little bit more organized, I think now it's, it's spread out a bit more. And so in that sense, it has to be addressed in that way. But the community has to take ownership of the problem. It can't just be left up to you know, law enforcement of the school. It has to be part of the solution. All right, so that's part of the solution. And I think that uh, we've talked about just up on the side about the need for how do we address the, at least the prevention and intervention piece? Although, David, I, I'm not sure that you would agree that that things have changed all that much because I think your your point is that the same recipe works. So the um, there's a, a kind of myth making that, that I see in a lot of places that you take a, a look at the street scene of the moment and it makes far less sense than we think that it ought to. Right? There's, a, there's a story that gets told about gangs and drug crews and such that says they're, they're purposeful and they're structured and, and they're rational economic enterprises and they have leadership and <coughs> violence is exercised in the, the, the interest of that leadership and its economic enterprise. And then you look at what's going on, and it is just as Carmen has, has said, it's, it's chaotic, it's disorganized, it feels more like, you know, pick up baseball than it does like the major leagues. And there's a, a kind of historicity that says it's, it's, it's devolving. And what we actually see across the country is that the, it would, never was like that in the first place. That the, the gang life that the crack era created. So what happened was crack was sold in public. Lots of groups of kids got together to sell crack. They were in these disorderly criminal environments. They got guns. And then, you know, the fire was lit. And the mistake we made at the time was saying, ah, 
this is because these are unregulated markets and you get ripped off or have a bad debt, you can't go to the police, so you have to go deal with it yourself. It only makes perfect sense. Um, if you read Freakonomics, Steve Levitt has this brilliant analysis of the role of violence in, in illicit drug markets. It has everything going for it except accuracy. <laughs> um, it's completely wrong. And one of the great things about being an economist is you know how the world works and you don't need any actual data. Um, what actually goes on on the street is chaotic and it is crazy and it is disorganized. And almost all the violence is personal. So this is, again, what we learned the very first time from, from the gang cops in Boston. They said, look, they're all drug dealers. They're all in drug food, but the violence is personal. It's boy-girl, it's disrespect, it's standing vendetta. And the more purposeful gangs won't let you behave like that because it's bad for business. It draws heat, it gets your attention. And Gene, Gene Rivers, who's one of the, the best known uh, activist preachers in, in Boston, came to one of our forums at one point, talked to these kids, and he said, look, you think the mafia behaves like this? You think, you think they shoot people over some beef with their ex-girlfriend's new boyfriend because they don't, you know, they don't like him, he's been disrespectful? They won't let their soldiers behave like that. There's actually someone in charge. And he looked at them and he said, if you're going to be gangsters, at least be good gangsters. <laughs> you know, and everybody laughed, but they totally got it. it my, so you're closer to the, the, the Boston street scene at the moment. Than I am. But what I see all over the place is people thinking that the streets work in a certain way. And then they get close enough to look at what's really going on. They don't work like that. And they say, oh, it's changing. No, it's not. It never was like that. And our kind of bumper sticker on this has become, you know, nobody has organized gangs except Chicago and LA. And Chicago and LA don't either. Because if you go talk to the people who really know the Chicago and LA gangs, they're not what their mythology is either. And I sit with Chicago gang cops and they say, oh God, back in the day they were organized, but now they're just running around out there. So it, it, none of it makes as much sense as we think it does. Yes, partial. Except for the fact that when you talk to a gang banger, they can draw they can draw a demographic map that will make your head spin. Oh yeah. And it tell you what turf is what and what area had just moved by last week. And you can look at the graffiti on the wall and see who just claimed what area. So there is a illogical social political structure that's going on that we don't understand. There is an economic commerce system that is going on that we clearly don't understand. I mean, one of my hardest conversations, I was trying to motivate this young person to think about going to college. And he had done all the numbers, and he said, now why would I go to your school and come out $200,000 in debt when I have $100,000 in my pocket? I mean, what am I going to respond? Because you'll be a better person? <laughs> I mean, what am I supposed to say? And I did continue the conversation. I said, I understand that. I said, well, perhaps you're, you're, you're you have longevity of life if you choose this way rather than this way. And we were able to engage. And he engaged with me because he trusted me. I wasn't trying to be condescending and make him feel bad. But that's the reality. These young people are walking around with money in their pocket. And the, everything that we you know, show is the American dream, right? The, many of them have already attained that, per se, right, on the surface level, per se. But I, I agree that they're, they're, they're the biggest change is that street credibility has changed, right? You earned your street credibility back in the day by doing certain deeds. Now, it's a different mechanism. And then the notion of respect, you earned respect in the past by doing certain deeds. Now, the assumption is you step on the scene as an eight-year-old, everybody's supposed to respect you or you're going to knock them off, right? And so in that nature, the sociological and political infrastructure of these, you know, gangs in many ways have been diminished because the OGs are no longer on the, on, on the playing field. Some of them have retired, you know, 50 and 60 year old, right? OGs have been locked away for 20, 30 years, and they come back and they're like, no, man, I'm not even, you know, they move to a different city to try to get a new start, but, but their legacy has followed. Aren't you such and such from, oh, yeah, man. 
And so they're kind of plugged out. And then you have the middle managers who are all of a sudden the bosses and are playing to win, right? It's the same thing happens in the corporate situation, right? You know, so, so now you're making new rules that never really existed. And you're right, there is no manual and there is no trickle down of, of, the, of, of the new rules except for the fact that you're, you're the kingpin now. And if you say do it because you wear, you know, the, the, the tattoos or whatever, you know, you have to, whatever it is, you know, everybody's supposed to follow you. Right? So the disorder, I always talk about organized chaos. It's organized in a chaotic, complex way, but it's organized. Believe it. I just wanted to follow up on what you just said. Do you think, though, that the person that's carrying the $100,000 in their pocket doesn't fear death or doesn't fear? Because perhaps that person's seen his friends, his brother, and I, I mean, you know, gotten shot at, gotten killed, and so they expect, hey, why do I need to behave? Why do I need to reach for a certain goal if I'm not going to live past 20? Is there that part of the mentality as well? Cornell West talked back in the 80s about the nihilism. Mm -hmm. He says that many of these young people have no desire to live 20 years because why would you want to live 20 years in this chaos? Mm -hmm. So we live day to day, moment by moment, hour by hour, with the hope that our death will be valiant. Right, that we would die and people would talk about us for, for years and years, that our legacy would be greater than our actual <coughs> livelihood. And so the real, realization is these young people have gone to so many funerals, mm -hmm. seen so many of their loved ones die, that death has no sting anymore. Mm -hmm. That the reality is they know that there's one appointment that you must keep, and that's the appointment of death. Mm -hmm. and so yeah. it is coming. Yeah. And they're shocky and PTSD and oh, depressed. And and so I was, I was in Oakland uh, last week, and I heard the following story from uh, Deputy Chief of the Oakland Police Department, which is that he had been investigating uh, a killing. Somebody had shot into a car, killed the driver, um, and there was a 16-year-old boy in the passenger seat. And so this police officer was trying, they knew, they knew who shot him. And he was trying to get the 16 year old to give up the shooter, which he wouldn't do, and finally just gave up and started talking to the kid. And at that point, the kid broke down and said of his dead friend, You know, at, at least he said, We think he lived a full life. The dead man was 21. Mm -hmm. And that is the world in these particular neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. that's, that's why this is all so important. <coughs> Well, it is 7.20 now, and we would like to open this up for some audience questions and comments. Um, the speakers have made some great points. So if you would, just go ahead up to the microphone um, and ask your questions. I have two questions. One, um, I'm wondering what effect our economic rights is going to have on efforts to Duplicate the Boston Miracle here and to make similar efforts in other cities. Because, you know, I understand that, that the, the concept is relatively simple, but it seems like it must take a lot of resources, especially the character part of it. Um, so, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'd be interested in hearing how, what effect you think that will have. And I also have a question about um, this kid with $100,000 in his pocket. I, I'm guessing, and I know you're going to correct me if I'm wrong that that $100,000 came from the drug trade. And, um, you know, I'm wondering if you all want to comment on the effect of um, our utterly failed drug prohibition policies. Um, thanks. Um, two good questions. So the first one is that we're actually seeing that the fiscal crisis is making all this much more plausible and appealing to people. A simple reason, which is an open secret, um, especially in law enforcement, but also in, in other parts of this world, that we spend vast amounts of resources on this, doing things that every normal just doesn't work. And what we're seeing, people are kind of willing to do that and stick with their old ideas and stick with their ideology when, when the money is there. But when the money goes away, they get a lot more serious. And it's why, and I am watching this happen and I'm 
confounded and ashamed of what I'm seeing. For the first time in, in living memory, people are paying attention to mass incarceration in the country. Not because we're locking up entire black neighborhoods, but because suddenly white folks don't want to pay their bills. And if it, if it means we turn around on this, then I guess that's a, a good thing, no matter what the reason, but it's obscene what's going on. Um, but this work actually doesn't take much in the way of extra resources. It takes focus and will and coordination and a willingness to, to think in different ways. But nearly everybody who's ever done it has done it with what they've got. And in most places, even, even the social service resources are there. Um, we, we throw away more social service dollars than you could possibly imagine. Doing, doing things that don't do the communities any good at all. One of the real surprises to me in, in this work was, you know, I was, I was used to and prepared for and became pretty understanding of why these communities hate the police. It came as something of a surprise to discover that they hate the social service providers nearly as much. They are condescending, they are abusive, they don't deliver, they, they do things that they think are good and doesn't do anybody on the other end any good. So this is more about being serious with what we've got than it is about being money. And crisis can be kind of a good thing in that respect. Um, on the $100,000, um, I have never met a kid with $100,000 in his pocket. I've met a lot of kids who tell me they have $100,000 in their pocket, but I've never actually met one. And when, when they're doing well in the drug game, and they do sometimes do well, but they don't do very well very consistently or very long. And if you look at their earnings over time, and this is one of the places where the research is very clear and, and actually is very helpful, um, you would do better working at a minimum wage job than working in a corner, almost always, because what you make, you don't make steadily, it gets taken away from you, it goes to legal fees, you get ripped off. Um, you, you count gross, not net, so people don't talk about what they put out, only what they take in, you know, all that kind of thing. Very, very few people actually do well um, selling drugs. I'm an educator for the Boston Public Schools, and there is a practice I wanted to ask your thoughts on. My students wear uh, pins of their friends who die. And sometimes they have multiple pens because they know so many people that die. And I feel like saying to them, why don't you wear the pictures of your friends who you want to protect and support? Can you just talk about, I guess, two questions. One is, how can, I mean, does that practice sort of memorialize those who die? I, I know that's what it's for, but in, in many ways, I feel that it's actually sensitive another message that it, it sort of heroizes the people who died. And then back to that question about middle school educators. And what do you think schools can do? Because we're, we're fighting this battle of trying to keep them in school and get, keep them interested. But the messages that are all around us is so difficult. So. Yeah, I would argue that we have to allow our young people to express themselves in whatever mechanisms they choose to. Because in those expressions, we actually hear their pain and feel their hurt. Um, so if you truncate that, you become another person who has who has muted their voice. Uh, one of the challenges of young people is they don't they don't cry the way we want them to cry, right? And so sometimes, and I, I had this philosophy. Um, if you use this, please use it. Just quote me on it. Um, it's, it's, it's the metaphor of crying baby. And so if you have a baby who was just born, they cry and cry and cry. And as parents, we don't necessarily know what they're talking about and what to do. So we go through a litany of one, two, three, check to see if they're wet, burp them, see if they need, you know, see if they need to move around, put them in a the little van and drive them around the neighborhood, maybe motion does with it. I had two kids, you can tell. And when they get six months old and they cry, we have a better mechanism of, of trying to kind of understand what's going on. We have our still litany of things. When they turn one years old, 
they're starting to make noises and whatnot and moving around. So we still have a litany of things that when they cry, by the time they're two, we still have a litany of things. But by the time they're eight or nine, we don't have that list of things. We're like, stop crying. Mm -hmm. Right? And the realization is that when we do that, they cry in their behavior. They cry in their disrespect. Mm -hmm. They cry in all the mechanisms that will get our attention so that we can go through the litany of things to show them that we love them. By the time they're 12 and 13, we're like, go to your room. Mm -hmm. Or you get kicked out of the house. And the realization is that the more we don't address their cry, the more dramatic and the more outrageous and the more raw they cry. To the point of picking up a gun and doing all this stuff, in many ways, just to get our attention. Mm. Right? When they turn 18, they start crying. We don't want to hear that. Go. You're a grown person and you're an adult. Go. And the, re the result is that we have traumatized our children by not having that litany, litany of responses for when they cry. So when they cry now, it's in their dress, it's in their wardrobe, it's in the lyrics of the songs. Mm -hmm. It's even in their articulation of misogynistic lyrics. Mm -hmm. And most of them don't even believe what they're saying because if you asked if you treat your mama that way, they would say, what are you talking, are you talking about my mom? No, mm -hmm. right? It's a disconnect between that. But we have to hear them as they express what they need to express in their own language as opposed to trying to make them talk to us in the language we want to hear. These young people need psychotherapy. They're suffering from post-traumatic stress. And we're waiting for them to say, I have post-traumatic stress. Can you help me? They're not going to say that. <laughs> but they're going to show you in their actions and their activities and the way they carry themselves and all that. So I think we need to allow them to speak and be vigilant and be receptive to what it is. In middle school, that's a transitional moment in everybody's life. Most important time you could ever have. What you can do is give them access to as many voices as possible. Here's what a postal person looks like. Here's what this person looks like. Here's what a professor looks like. Here's what a lawyer looks like. Here's what a good, wholesome citizen looks like. Here's what a person who has decided to stay home and take care of their family looks like. Not all of these kind of perpetuated, stereotypical, you know, models of success. Here's a powerful corporate lawyer. You know, here's what the trash person who comes in our community every week and takes care of all of us. Here's what this person looks like, right? And give them access to all of these different images so when they dream, they actually have material to dream with as opposed to being limited to what they just see. That's powerful work being a middle school teacher. I applaud you on this. Can, can I, uh, I would want to follow up on that because we, we're starting to deal a lot more with middle schools in terms of uh, my, my talking before. And I think what you, I know one thing that we try to focus on is trying to figure out ways to empower these children and look at, um, and sort of let them know that they can make choices. But it's not just getting up there and saying you have choices and this is what you can do. I think you have to provide them with examples and then you have to provide them with the opportunities. And I'll give you an example we did in, in Lynn because we've been doing a lot in, in Brooklyn and Lynn, and Lynn because that's the one most recently. We recently, um, one of my assistant U.S. attorneys working along with the Lynn Police Department, working along with the school and working along with some community organizations put together a resource. <coughs> we did this in May for the summer for the kids. We had a, a day fair. And it was basically a resource fair and a book. We went out to all of the communities, different businesses, different um, uh, boys, boys and Girls Club, the um, uh, different retail establishments, um, camps, uh, uh, sports, uh, academics, so that they had options. Do you want to work over the summer? Do you want to study? Do you want to do art? Do you want to do sports? Different types of opportunities and resources. And we went a day, I spoke about making choices and how you make the right choices and how you ask for help and how we're there to help you. And not just we, but really the school, the community. And then a young man spoke. Um, a young man who is now in his 20s, but who when he was 12 um, was dealing drugs. Because that's all he knew. His mother and father had, had, had been dealing drugs and that's when he started dealing drugs. But when he was 17, um, he got caught, got prosecuted, and did a year in jail. When he did that year in jail, he didn't want to go back. And so he talked about what it took to get back on his feet and how he had to ask for help. And that there's help there if you ask for it, but, but 
but you need to, to see what's out there. But it's hard for some of them to ask for it, so you need to show them the way as to what's available for them. So you, it, it's sort of like a two-part process, and I'm not saying that's the complete solution, but it was so well received because I felt that the kids had someone um, who they could aspire to be, uh, someone who had struggled and made, but then here are choices. You can get psychological help, but when they're dealing with their emotional problems and you know they'd like to have a job, they'd like to have or an activity to be engaged in, they'd like to be with other kids that are engaged in something that's positive, it has to be made available. And I think you need to reach out to the community and on the resource question earlier, you know, there are, uh, even though there are dire times ahead, you know, Boston, for example, just recently received uh, a $2 million grant um, for the Defending Childhood Initiative, which is going to focus on how you help kids deal with violence and really how do you prevent kids' observations in violence. And they also received another $2 million uh, community-based youth <coughs> violence prevention program to, to provide resources. That's one aspect, but another thing that we try to do is really reach out to foundations and private industry, because it's in their interest to reduce violence as well and to deal with it. So you've got to reach out to other resources that are out there, and it's not easy. Don't, mm. it, this is not easy work. Mm. It, it, I think it's hard work, but I think that you've got to be creative and try to think out of the box and also make other people feel that it's their responsibility as well to deal with the problem. So, this question has pushed one of my buttons. Um, and I, I want to make clear here that I'm not, I'm not piling on the questioner, no matter what I'm about to say sounds like, so I just want to be very clear about that. Um, so we are in Boston. So the question was about these things the kids wear. And the fact is that this kind of new folk ways for memorializing the dead are part of the emerging, emergent fabric in these neighborhoods. You see kids with the names of their dead tattooed on their forearms and on their fingers. You see the street shrines everywhere. And so we are in Boston. When ceasefire fell apart in Boston, there were so many people killed, and there are so many street shrines in Rock Ferry, Dorchester, and Mattapan. It's Boston City Council actually took up a measure considering the civil regulation of street shrines in Boston. Oh. So the cities of Boston, the city of Boston, response to all the dead kids was to talk about getting rid of their memorials. The memorials and the pins and the tattoos are not the problem. The dead kids are the problem. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't have a question, but what I'd like to do is echo what I've heard from all three of you. First with you, David, what you said is something that I agree with. We, some of us, have to be willing to speak with gang members, whoever they are. Secondly, uh, with the comments that, it's just my experience, it, it's imperative. This is an American problem. Everyone needs to be involved. It's a we problem. And then finally, what the Reverend said, I agree with this is not a race problem. This is our problem. Too many children and young people are dead by guns and name. Too many African American, <coughs> Spanish, Korean, and also Caucasian. Um, so, what, I, what I'm saying to each of you is everything I've heard. I agree with, and I'm echoing. Same from my own experience. I've spent uh, a decade daily, and sometimes with groups and others, working against gun violence. I'll say it like that. I want to just mention one text that was published after the Boston Miracle by a woman named Catherine Newman at Harvard. Uh, some people may not know, so I'll say it. Rampage the social routes of school shootings. So that's a study uh, that's now more than 10 years old. Study. Uh, School shootings in America, more or less the same, whether it was urban or rural, a boy of boys isolated, and then they shoot. Now I want to follow up on that. Unfortunately, the gangs have changed. And I'm not addressing this to uh, 
professor, but it's true. Some of us know what would have known about three weeks ago here in Harmwell, uh, North Plymouth High School. Fortunately, I believe four girls were arrested and they were planning a Columbine style shooting. It was on Facebook. Um, it didn't happen, thank God. So this is, to my way of thinking, it's our problem, it's an American problem. Um, it, it's imperative that we continue doing whatever we're doing, but do something. Um, it's interesting to me that I've spent the last decade trying to contribute a little bit. It's very interesting to me that after this uh, incident in uh, North Plymouth, after the reporting was on Channel 5 and maybe one paper, it, the silence, I don't have anything. I'm assuming there was four Caucasian high school girls, but I don't know yet. But So <coughs> I just want to say this back and then sit down. It's not a race problem. There is economics involved. That was mentioned one way or another. Uh, all of us have to be involved. I can't mention that. Uh, anyone who's willing, and finally David, what David said, I found, I found it to be true. It's difficult to talk to a gang member, whether it's an NRA member, some veteran, and I know that's different than me, but what I found out is I have to listen. I have to listen to people who disagree with me, because it happens every day. But it's, it's the only way I know. So I'm just glad to hear each of you and, and to say that I haven't heard anything from you that I could disagree with. But uh, the problem ha has changed. Our children are dying now. Now girls are taking it up, and it was mostly boys. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I just want to first thank um, the panel um, for holding this forum. I think this is a very important forum. Um, personally, I think it's 10 years too late, but that's without saying. Um, I also just want to, before I get to my question, just quickly acknowledge that there were some young people here who were on the balcony level where I was sitting and they have since gone. Um, and watching them leave really made me pose a question, why isn't there a young person and, uh, on, on, as a member of this panel? Uh, because we're talking about young people in a way we're still, you know, we're still doing that thing when we're detaching ourselves from them because they're not here speaking for themselves um, when we're talking about violence amongst young people. Um, and I say this because I am a youth worker. I'm born and raised in Boston. I actually grew up in Mattapan. Um, and I was a teenager during the time of Operation Ceasefire. And I agree with you, it was not a miracle. And I also get frustrated when people call it a miracle because it was a lot of work, it was a lot of resources, and it was a lot of will. And that gets to my question. Um, you know, I have been doing um, violence prevention work for the last 12 years, um, working with young people hand in hand. In fact, I'm going to be leaving here right after this forum to take the, the train out to Brockton because a youth called me today and said she really wanted some help. Um, that is how I see the importance of the work that I do. But I also notice that a lot of my colleagues um, don't necessarily see it that way. And I, when I say colleagues, I mean people in the social service field. Um, and it's just why there's a growing antagonism towards social service work. There's a lot of people, who, youth workers, who at 6 o'clock say, oh, it's time for me to go home. Knowing that when youth leave that building, that's when they're going to engage in crime. So we have to approach this differently. We have to think about these things very differently. And the other thing I want to get to is this idea around um, community uh, participation. Um, we've all heard of it, I'm sure. At least nine out of 10 of us in this room have heard the, this, the, the phrase, it takes a village, um, it, we all have to stick together. But yet, I'm willing to bet nine out of 10 of us are going to go home and say, that was a really nice form, and not really take any action tomorrow. So my question to the, really to the public here, is how do we crack that wall of building the will to take action in our communities and address the issue of violence? Because that is truly, as you all said, void of racism, void of politics. At the end of the day, it's about supporting our young people and the way they need to be supported. And we're, even though we're saying, yes, it takes everyone, that, that is true. I gotta tell you, I feel very alone right now and the fact that I am the only one of my colleagues who's willing to take the train out at night to Brockton to support a young person. And I gotta tell you, I don't see a lot of people who are willing to do that, even though they're willing to shake their heads and say, yes, this is a community issue. So what advice do you all have to everyone 
about how do we crack that culture? I just want to applaud you for your work. Really? Um, and thank you for being a leader amongst leaders. I mean, I think the issue is that most of us are not equipped and trained, and we have the courage to do something, but we don't have the, the wherewithal, right? So, so not all of us are equipped to talk to gang bangers. Right. Some some of us it's best that we don't. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I mean, because of our own disposition and the stuff that we bring and our own posture and our insensitivity, you know, some of us have never lived that life and don't understand it enough to be able to resonate. But my my inclination is, well, you're not talking to a game baby, you're talking to a person. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference. When we allow them to be re-engage as human beings, then we're all equipped to do that. When you see something going on and be, and have be courageous enough to speak to it while it's going on. I mean, how many of us have witnessed some kind of crime or whatnot? And, I mean, even if it's just, you know, some kind of verbal abuse or whatnot. And I mean, there's a show on television about this. You know, and they stage things and people just walk by and you know, go home feeling guilty because they didn't help. You know, I think our desire and our our ability to step into the uncomfortable zone, right? And then with the economic situation, some of us have some money, right? And we can make resources available so some of our really underpaid uh, youth workers can, can have some resources, you know, some of these uh, uh, associations. So I think there's multiple things that we can do, but we need to be willing to ask the question, how can I help? So, I'm going to be disruptive here. Hmm. Um, it's comforting to say that this is not a racial issue, it's about all of our communities. And, and in a certain way, I think that's right. Um, all of our communities have various kinds of trauma. And also, I think it's just fundamentally misleading. White kids don't go to school with pins of their dead on their sleeves. White kids don't worry about not living until they're 21. Most white parents, except in the most general way, do not worry about their kids getting killed every time they walk out the door. This kind of serious violence is fantastically concentrated in certain distressed black communities. It's not even nearly so prevalent in distressed Hispanic communities. It is part of the product of the particular and, and awful and toxic experience of being black in the United States. It didn't start with crack. It's not recent, except that for all kinds of, of reasons, in the recent past, it has gotten dramatically worse. These are communities that are in crisis. And when we say the community needs to step forward and solve this, which is something that folks from outside the community say all the time, I will, you know, I have never seen an organized community of any kind. You know, the, the well-off suburbs are not safe because they're organized and people come back from doing their jobs every day and go out and give up their own time to do community work. We don't, we don't ask of the better off amongst us what we insist on asking for from these already distressed and marginalized and overworked and traumatized communities. And my view, so I, I will offend everybody in the room by the time I'm done. Um, if we have solutions that demand that everybody get together and work together and give up themselves, those aren't solutions because people don't behave like that. We can, we can say we want it, but it's not going to happen. And people say to me, how do we get the white folks to care about this? You're not going to. I wish it were otherwise. It's wrong. I don't like it. It's not going to happen. People have their own lives to live. We need approaches that will work with what we've got. And the good news of the last 20 years or so of work on this is that those solutions are now at hand. We don't have to do all the stuff that we tell ourselves we need to do in order to keep the kids from getting killed. 
We may want to do a lot of that stuff anyway because it's good work, but we can save the lives now. not facetious what I'm about to say. I'm not sure which question is directed at me. Um, but let, let, me, let me speak to what the gentleman said. Um, so these, these neighborhoods that I have spent my adult life in now have this set of joined at the hip problems. So, the violence is way too high. Many of them are dealing with the chaos that comes with public drug dealing and drug activity. The reason for which is to serve idiot white guys from outside the neighborhood because that's the only reason to stand on the corner and sell drugs. Um, with the mass incarceration that the rest of the world has visited upon it in order to, they thought, do something about the first two problems. And, the, and I'll, I'll, I'm, I want to be careful about this because I, I live in all of these worlds. I live in the neighborhoods, I live with the street guys, I live with the cops, and the cops are not racist. 
The cops have written the neighborhoods off, which feels like almost the same thing, but fortunately it's not, because if they were racist, you couldn't change their minds, and you can change their minds. There are three communities here. This is one way I think about it. There's, there's the streets, there's what we usually call the, the, the community, which is the good people in the neighborhood, and there's the community of law enforcement. And they all are at odds with each other. And in the black community, the, the intrusive policing, the unlawful searches, the everybody getting stopped, everybody getting arrested, uh, all the men going to prison. You know, one of the reasons the men aren't there is because they're locked up, because we've done that to them. Um, that plays in seamlessly to the real historical experience of the community being abused under color of law for most of our, our American history and prehistory. And one thing it does is make the community silent because nobody wants to stand up and say, put your guns down and stop selling drugs because that means you're standing with a race enemy and nobody wants to do that. That gets read by the cops as, and I can't tell you how many times I've heard this, nobody cares, it's normal, it's cultural, and my personal favorite, everybody's living off drug money, which is honest to God what the cops think. It's not true. It is so fantastically not true. People really do believe it, just like the community believes that the drugs are there because the CIA is bringing them in. And the book goes on at length about this, and there is a great deal to say about it, but the most important thing to say about it is that all those views are mistakes. The cops are not racist. They are acting abominably, but they are not racist. The community is not all living off drug money. And it turns out that part of this work and the way in which it has evolved dramatically since the Boston ceasefire days is working with both law enforcement and communities to understand that so that they can each change their behavior. The cops have to stop stopping everybody for no reason. They have to stop locking everybody up. And the community needs to say, we don't want this here. And it turns out that in very short order, you can get willing folks on both sides to move in those directions. And then things really change. They really, really change. I hate to interrupt, and I know that you have a couple more questions to respond to from the last questioner. Um, but, you know, I run a tight ship. We only have about 10 minutes, and I, I really hope, it, I, I hate to truncate the answers, but I hope that we get to all of our questioners who stand up. So I just wanted to give you the 10 minute warning. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, I just want to follow up on that because. Um, you know, I've been in law enforcement for a long time. I was a, a state prosecutor for a number of years. And um, more recently, I've been a federal prosecutor for the last 14 years. And I've been the United States Attorney for the last um, two years this November, having been appointed by President Barack Obama. I feel very fortunate to have done this job. And I, and I do think that there may be, obviously, some abuses because you read about them, they occur, and nothing nothing is, is as simplistic as it may seem, but I don't view the world that black and white, and I do not view it with the generalities that you just um, spoke of. I do not see that the police, as a general premise, have written you know the neighborhoods off, because I, I've worked with the police, and I'm not saying that it's all a perfect mix, not by any means. But I've worked with officers, I've been to community meetings where if they had written the, the, the community off, we wouldn't have. I, there was about 200 people, community members in Roxbury this past year, uh, where I went to speak, where we went and talked about problems, how we can play a better role and do a better job in helping them deal with their issues. Uh, I recently spoke at a teen center at St. Peter's Church, um, I, 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 and I apologize if it was Dorchester or Mattapan, but there was a team of young kids uh, playing basketball against a team of police officers that were, and, and these are regular basketball games that take place. I, um, I just don't like generalities, that the police as a, as a premise have written, every, have written a neighborhood off. I think they're, they're working very, very hard to work with the neighborhood, to work with the youth, um, and to deal with what uh, is, is a bad situation 
And, you know, and I have to say that in Boston, uh, in dealing with my colleagues and United States attorneys across the country, uh, there are many areas that are, 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 are way worse than our city. We are way ahead of the curve. But, you know, I said this at one community meeting and, and everyone agreed. But when you have one shooting, that's one shooting too many. We still have a problem. So we can't just say, oh, Boston's doing much better than many other cities across the country. We still have a problem. And, and the brick that you had asked me about, the Boston Regional Intelligence Center, basically that's just an information gathering center where um, it's, it's critical. That's how we identify it. It's just a report. It, it basically takes data on the reporting of crimes so that if you track the data, you can tell how many shootings are occurring in this, on this street or on this neighborhood. How many times has this individual been arrested? What kind of record does this individual have? To sort of identify the problem, describe the problem, and figure out where is it most concentrated so that you can then determine how to address it. And so it's, it's a way of gathering, but it's not like some secret um, CIA info. Does no, the CIA collect data also? I, I would think so, not in this country. CIA works, uh, you know, so Central that's Intelligence Agency. Yeah. FBI collect data? Of course it does. Everyone corrects and collects data. <coughs> you can't do your job unless you have a real assessment of what the problem is. If I may, my name is uh, Sam Baker. I'm a software engineer and an entrepreneur. And uh, I'm newly in the Boston area. And I really want to, for the sake of brevity for my friends here, I want to direct my questions to the Reverend here, specifically with acknowledgement to you, the U.S. Attorney, because um, I truly want to applaud what the federal courts are doing. I attended an event with my colleague, Kevin Thomas, and the uh, drug court there in the federal courts, and I truly believe they have a spirit of trying to prevent recidivism. We need that thin blue line. We need to understand where the boundaries are. But, uh, Reverend, I, I appreciate what you're doing here. And I don't agree that the issue is racism. I think it's more socioeconomic. And I think we need to capture the zeitgeist, or what Cornell Wilson would call it, the attachment, or Emil Durkheim would call the social enemy of that inner city culture by capturing the hip hop, the rap, what that culture is all about, do what I'm doing, create a revenue generating enterprise so that there truly is a way out. Don't try to eradicate these gangs, let's embrace them and show them another way. We know that, and you've talked about, there's lack of mentorship, there's, as the gentleman here talked about, there's lack of fathers, but let's celebrate what there is, not, not denigrate the bad, but celebrate the good. So I ask you, Mr. Smith, what are you doing to engage other entrepreneurs like myself participate in your community to create these enterprises. Got a great idea, I'm working with Mel King, other community leaders in Boston, so I'm looking to you to invite with me to work on this. I'm also a co-founder of Atlanta City of Peace, so I want to spread this, this, this vehicle out nationally. So what can you do to help me, and how can we collaborate and invite others to collaborate as well? That's a beautiful thing, and I mean, you know, the realization is that uh, gangs are just social structures, mm -hmm. and there's nothing new about them. Mm -hmm. um, they've always existed. Um, and so the realization is if you use that infrastructure that's already there and present a cooperative development and economic model to empower young people to be the owners of their own destiny and have hope and have promise and to show them what the end means looks like, I mean, it's a beautiful thing. We should talk afterwards. Um, I, I'd love to do that. Back to your question, um, I am a, a, a professing Christian. There's no question about that. I'm an ordained minister. But you have not once heard me mention the name Jesus or God up in here, right? And, that, and that's just who I am, right? So I'd rather people to see who I am and then ask me, what does it take to be me? And then we can have that conversation. And my introduction to all folks is that you have a purpose in this world. And you can articulate that purpose in your own language. But let me help you to figure it out. And we call that spirituality versus religion or theology, if you, if you will. So I love that question. I mean, I, I leave on, the, on, on this note, 1903, the great sociologist W.B. Du Bois said the problem of the 20th century is color line. Mm -hmm. We haven't solved that issue. The mm -hmm. problem of the 21st century is the color line plus the social economic line. Mm -hmm. And so it's all conflated. Mm -hmm. We're no longer in black and white television. We're in color, folks, mm -hmm. right? So we can't deal in black and white television conversation, right? We got biracial children, we got, you know, all kind of mixes and you know we got fuchsia children and magenta and periwinkle blue i mean it's a beautiful thing we got to own it the black and white days i mean we got to move past that first of all i want to thank all of you up there for coming here trying to deal with this issue i if i had my brothers, I would want to have seen it in Grove Hall. Mm -hmm. My name is 
is out of the And uh, this gentleman here is named William Celeste. But we claim the miracle of Boston's crime. Jamal, would you pass this out to those party up there? You talked about fighting crime in the 90s. In the 90s, this town had done such a great job, we drew 50,000 people to Franklin Park. 50,000 people. The following year, 40,000. Because the police and the community work together. That does not, is not happening today. We can forget it. There were state police there. This man became the person in charge of Newark Police Department, William Celeste. Used to be a little rough himself. We have not addressed the real problem here, and pardon me for being so bold. We had a gun turn in at Muhammad's mosque. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you that I represent Louis Farrakhan in the nation of Islam. The police had a gun turn in at Muhammad's mosque. 128 guns were turned in. 64 came from Muhammad's mosque. When there was working relationship with the police, we were so in tune with the authorities in this city, we were allowed to name the patrol for the police. Whenever they left Area B, they had to visit 30 spots if they were going just as far as Mattapan, called the Power Patrol. Is that right, Billy? Right. We can stop fighting crime. Forget about it. Fight drugs and you fight crime at the same time. <clears throat> oh, there are places where whites pick up drugs. Big time. They're the biggest users, sir. That's what I said. No, I said users. I'm not talking about sellers now. That's exactly what I said. Okay, let me finish. They're big users and sellers. I'm not, that's not my point. But because of their number and the population, that's why they are big users. There are young men in the black community who will take a roll of money and put a $50 bill on it. They don't make any money in the drug business. <coughs> Judge Hammond of the Dorchester Court has written a position that 1,000 drug cases come before her every month. That's 250 a week. The drug dealers that come into the community from outside of the community, they can get away if they are not within the requirements of the school zone. Let's make this perfectly clear. The only reason that young black men get involved in drugs is because they don't have a father in the house. A boy ain't fear his mother. 71% of all black children are born in a home where there's only a mother. This started back with and, uh, Daniel P. Monahan did a book and then interviewed me and Louis Farrakhan. Crisis in the black community. You want to know who stopped it? Black preachers stopped it. Daniel P. Moynihan found out through study that if a young black boy doesn't have a strong male image in the family, mama can't handle him after 10 years old. You can go upside his head, it ain't gonna bother him. I got evidence that there are 15 cities in America that produce marijuana. It is the gateway to drugs. They didn't start out as gangs, they started out as crews, as families. They got involved in gangs because of it. Let me tell you, gentlemen, something. Let's not be hypocritical. Oh, 
I'm missing another page here. <laughs> if we want to fight crime, throw it in the garbage. Just fight drugs. That's all you got to do. All you got to do is fight drugs. There's a man standing over sitting there. A murderer. A murderer. But we turned him around because we turned his mind around. As we speak right now, going on at Muhammad's mosque, there are thugs who authorities have asked us to talk to and turn around. What is going on in this city? There is no more unity. No set. This man went to Newark and turned it around. We used to have a meeting on the third Thursday of every month with every police agency. Show me somewhere where we are talking about. Because what I'm talking about died or started dead, sir, in the early 90s because there was no more unity in the Boston Police Department and the community. You want to ask this man some questions of me? No, I'm going to be very quick. Uh, the area in Boston, I ran for 11 years before I went to Newark. I heard uh, the U.S. Attorney say, and probably there's a lot you don't know, that we have a good police department, good police commission and all that. That is not true. When we have a gang unit that's mostly all white, and you won't even put black supervisors in it, something's wrong. That wouldn't happen if I was in charge. When you have K cars, they call them, three going out in District 3, others going out in District 2, all over the area, all white, that are pulling, up, pulling kids up, making them go, uh, put their hands against the wall, there's something wrong. When you have a police commissioner that won't even talk to the Black Police Association, won't even talk to them, then something's wrong with that police commissioner. When you have a senator stand up and address this to the police commissioner, and he gets mad and won't meet with him again, when you have a city government that only meets with certain ministers, and he's been meeting with those ministers for over 16 years, and nothing's gotten better, they've gotten worse, because he refuses to listen to the people that can help him. Because we're too militant, or we have different ideas than he has. The problem here is unless you want to work with the community, I say to you, you if you lived in a white community, and you walked into a police station, and every cop in the police station was black, would you feel like it represented you? I know I wouldn't. And what we have to do, I used to take, take salt and pepper cars and put them out there. I used to meet with the Nation of Islam and every group that everybody was afraid to meet with. We, made, we, we had the first uh, 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 gang meeting. It didn't happen in the 90s, it happened in the 80s. We did all of that. The, the organization they're talking about that turned around in the 90s, we were doing that in the 80s. And that's why we were able to solve problems and until we, address the problem of racism on the police department. And I'm not saying it's a lot of police officers. I'm saying it has to come from the top. And until we address that problem, we're going to have a problem. I can't get into the ministers and all of that. Uh, that that's another subject. Sir, I'm going to stop you right there. Okay. And, okay. and I thank you. I'm, glad, I'm so glad that you two came up and said something. I think this is a great thing to leave ringing in people's ears. Sir, you said stop the drugs in order to stop the crime. I think that's a great thing, but we have people from the community come up and be the last thing that we hear on the subject, because the subject's not over. We still have a lot to talk about. Unfortunately, I hate to cut you off, but I've got my, to get my grandfather home to Danvers. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you, sir. I am One so, quick, quick, quick. Are you going to be quick? Very quick. <laughs> my grandfather is exhausted. Okay. <laughs> Hello, my name is Ron Owens. I'm an ex-offender from Grove Hall, Castle Gate Road. Family lived there for 30 years. I've listened to everybody on the panel, and there were some wonderful things said. But, if I could make my personal opinion presented here, I think one of the fundamental problems that has gone worse has been the economic deprivation of people in certain concentrated areas. 
forces of racism, drug infestation, police brutality, those all correlate to make a bad situation even worse. I'm, I'm going to stop you now, now because the, it's so brilliant. Now the last <laughs> thing, the last thing is for Mrs. Ortiz. Okay. One, I got out after 13 years in prison. Some of these impact players who have changed their lives around, as Mr. Muhammad spoke about, they don't have resources truly available. In word only are these things available. I invented, and it's on the web, a resource manual for ex-offenders because they gave me, after 13 years, a book that was designed in the 70s where the agencies didn't exist. But that was what we were given. So there is some disconnect in what is really happening and what people profess to say is happening when they get the government grants. That's all. Thank you. You want to plug your website? Uh, it's uh, cominghomedirectory.org. Coming directory.org. Thank you.